So I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here because I don't really do biophysics. So <laughs> you will see that uh, it has more to do with computational biology or protein engineering and uh, uh, yeah, so but not really maybe strictly speaking bio biophysics. Um, actually, you have seen this slide already yesterday uh, in a slightly different form in the talk of Eric. Um, so, of course, we all know that the genetic information is shared uh, among all cells and nonetheless, they have so different uh, uh, looks or they perform different functions. So, it's quite interesting to imagine how can that happen. Um, and we know that this is due to the fact that even if the genes are there, they are not always all expressed. So it's a matter of which genes uh, sets are expressed in certain circumstances. And that's how cells are uh, able to differentiate and to or maybe react to different external stimuli. Um, so the process of gene expression is, uh, is very complicated. It contains many steps. We have to go from the DNA to the mRNA. The mRNA then has to be translated in the protein. The protein has to fold uh, in its three-dimensional structure. So we have actually many steps and regulation can occur at m uh, any of these steps. So that's why uh, I think already yesterday we talked uh, about the fact that when we speak about gene expression, uh, what are we really talking about? So different people might talk about different things. So for instance, in the talk, uh, I will mostly speak about this step. So how do we really go from the gene uh, to a transcript? Um, and uh, yes, in, in mammalian cells, actually, this regulation is a bit more complex, maybe, than in bacteria. In bacteria, for instance, it's known that the uh, ground state is on, and uh, most of the time you have to really bring a repressor uh, to go to the off state, while in mammalian cells, the ground state is off. Um, also, I'm here. Uh, and then a series of events have to occur um, to actually go to the, to the on state, where transcription is occurring, and you have really many more proteins that uh, uh, get in touch with each other, they form complexes in order to bring the RNA polymerase uh, that starts really this process of, of the transcription. Um, so in order to um, um, activate transcription, actually there are special proteins that are called transcription factors and they are essential uh, to uh, activate a, pr a, a promoter, so to start a transcription and they actually have interesting properties. So transcription factors have um, they can be seen as modular proteins. Actually, the concept of, of modularity is very key of proteins, uh, is very key to uh, the, the, the field of synthetic biology in general because it allows us to take out of a protein a module that is doing a certain function and assemble it together with something else to uh, create a molecule that maybe does not exist in nature uh, that responds to, say, this stimulus but achieves this function that is given by this module. And, and this is also part of transcription factor in the sense that they are, they can be decomposed into the DNA binding domain. This is needed because the transcription factor needs to bind to the DNA. And the transactivation domain that most transcription factor have. Uh, sometimes this is a separate protein that comes in. And this is the domain actually that contacts then other transcription uh, regulators that then bring the, trans the, the RNA polymerase to the promoter. And most of these transcription factors contain sequences that will allow them to enter the compartment where transcription has to occur, which is the nucleus. So they have so-called nuclear localization sequences or also nuclear export sequences that uh, somehow regulate this balance between the localization, the final localization of this transcription factor. So they have to, uh, this transcription factor have to find their target on the genome. So, um, Actually, yesterday, I think, in these equations uh, from Bill, uh, he was talking more about Andrew, or Bill, I forgot his name, sorry. So anyway, um, it was about diffusion, I think. But it's very often thought that actually these transcription factors, they also bind unspecifically DNA, and then they slide along the DNA. So they also uh, uh, somehow reduce the search right, uh, from the three-dimensional space onto sliding onto the DNA to find their target. And then finally, they find their target, and they sit there, and they can bring all these other uh, uh, machinery, all the rest of the machinery to start transcription. And um, for instance, if we zoom in into this region, how would it look like? There are a few elements that I would like you to keep in mind because they become important uh, later on in the rest of the talk. 
So for instance, we have so-called response elements. So these are specific sequences that are um, recognized by the transcription factor where it, where it bind with sequence specificity. And uh, so this is really characteristic of the transcription of most transcription factors that have a sequence specific uh, uh, DNA they bind to. Um, and then usually you have a TATA box uh, where the uh, TATA binding protein is, is uh, binding also, and then you have a transcriptional start site where transcription will start. Um, so what is really um, exciting, if you want? So in the last, in the few, la last, maybe last decade or so, it became very clear that transcription factors are not only uh, coming into the nucleus um, after a stimulus and, and residing there all the time and doing their job, but there are more complex uh, situations where actually they come and then go in a pulsatile fas fashion. And these pulses can be either very regular, if, oh, sorry, like, like these ones, or they can be damped oscillations if you want, or they can be rather called pulses or, or spikes, you know, they come inside and, and they have different amplitudes. So this is uh, uh, seen in, uh, from, from yeast up to mammalian cells. Um, of course, not bacteria in that sense, because bacteria don't have a nucleus um, properly uh, separated by, by a, a membrane, right? So it's, of course, the nucleoid is also present and, and very likely some regulation in bacteria occurs as well we, uh, with localization of mole. Actually, not very likely does occur, but not in the very sense of having it cytoplasmic and then, and then nuclear. So this is actually very, very exciting if you want. And um, so people in the, in, this, in the past years, they have realized that depending on the stimulus that comes on the cell, you can have the same transcription factor showing different dynamics. So with dynamics, I really mean the pattern through time of the, of the activity of the transcription factor. That can be, say, the localization to the nucleus, but can also be a phosphorylation state if, if a transcription factor, for instance, is always residing inside the nucleus, but needs to be, say, a dimer or a tetramer to bind to the DNA. So it can mean activity. So this can be in this uh, axis. Yeah? Uh, can be the activation or the localization. So, for instance, P53 is a very famous uh, uh, um, um, regulator of, of uh, st stress responses inside the cell. So, it's called the guardian of the genome because it's uh, um, blocking the cell cycle or even telling the cells to undergo apoptosis if the stress is so high that the cell cannot repair it. Um, and so, it has been observed that if you have different stimuli, it either, for instance, like gamma irradiation, you have these pulses with the very cute, or uh, let's say interesting characteristic that the, what changes is the number of pulses, but not their amplitude. So the amplitude stays the same, and the number of pulses will increase with increasing stress. But another type of stress leads to a very different dynamical pattern, where actually we have like a one single pulse of activation that falls off, and here in this case, the amplitude is proportional uh, to the stress. So that's, uh, uh, um, this leads to the idea. So here on this stage, we know, okay, different stresses, different uh, um, uh, dynamics. But then on top of that, it has been shown, at least for P53, that if you have pulses, you have one type of response in the cells, for instance, cell cycle arrest. But if you have some sort of sustained P53 signal, you get apoptosis. So this would mean different dynamics, different responses. So the, the question is, is it really true that it's truly the dynamics that lead to these, these different responses? Um, so this is actually the biological question we want to answer in our lab. That is, do really transcription factor dynamics matter uh, uh, to decide which set of genes um, are, are going to be activated? And if so, then, how is the decoding done inside the cell? So something has to be uh, telling to the cell that this is the very same transcription factor, but this time it has to activate set, set, uh, uh, this set of genes, and in this other case, it has to activate another set of genes. So something has to be able to decode this information. And we think this is done at the promoter level, and, and you will see some um, data about that later on. Okay, but now we are synthetic biologists. Uh, we want to um, have a, let's say, an experimental setup that allow us to control uh, the, the system externally. So we want to have a way to control the transcription factor. Right? So if we want to ask the question, 
are the dynamics important? We need to control the dynamics. So eventually what we would like to have is a scenario where, for instance, the transcription factor is in the cytoplasm and we know uh, that this is the inactive state of the, of the transcription factor. It's away from its target. Then comes a trigger, should come a trigger, and, oh, sorry, keep on uh, uh, having the wrong button, uh, and the transcription factor comes inside this, uh, the nucleus, and then it can start this activation uh, of transcription. So now the question is how to play around, which kind of trigger should it be, and uh, what, is a, what is a good way to go. And uh, maybe here, to, for those of you who have not too much uh, uh, knowledge about that, a very brief, uh, super, super brief introduction about nuclear import. So this is a very complex, uh, uh, so the, the, the it's a complex process, which is, of course, once again, highly regulated. Um, although we have some proteins that are very, very small uh, or smaller, and they can actually go through these uh, uh, pores uh, that are found on the nuclear envelope just via diffusion, passive diffusion, so there is no energy spent for these molecules, but actually for most of the cargos uh, there is in the indeed uh, energy that is spent and uh, there is a special uh, machinery, so the import machinery that is engaged and you have to have in mind mainly uh, one signal that is uh, critical for this, which is the nuclear localization sequence or signal, um, and this is like a it's a train ticket or something where, where the, the protein says, I need to come inside, and then comes something else, so the importing, alpha, beta, and then they will bring the protein, the cargo, through this uh, uh, complex, uh, the, the, the pore complex, and then release the cargo inside, and then they can re get recycled and come out. So not too much to remember, just remember that if you have proteins that need to be actively transported inside the nucleus, you need a nuclear localization sequence. And vice versa, if you want to be actively exported from the nucleus, so here is not depicted, but you need a n n n NES, so a nuclear export sequence that will just trigger the reverse uh, process with a nuclear export uh, 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 factor, uh, so the, the, the CRM1 receptor. So how do the, these uh, um, NLSs are actually, uh, they, they, they can come in two flavors if you want. One is a so-called monopartite. So this is just one stretch of, of uh, basic residues. They are all together. Uh, but in, another in some other proteins actually have a different type of NLS, which is called bipartite NLS, uh, where you have two type of, uh, two stretches uh, separated by some sequence in between. And this, uh, again, will, will come back later, so why am I telling you now? Just that you have a kind of a, a brief idea about the story of these various NLSs, because in what comes later on, the story of the bipartite NLSs uh, will come back and it will be uh, important. Okay, so there are already methods out there to control uh, import of proteins. So for instance, so the, the, the two main ones are uh, you use either hormones or a small molecule like rapamycin. So, just to give you an idea, so one, in one case you can fuse your protein of interest uh, to this steroid hormone receptor domain. So how the thing works is that in the absence of this hormone, your protein will be bound to the HSP90, uh, which chaperone that will make you stay stuck in the cytoplasm. So when I say you, means you are the protein of interest in this case. So you are there and you can't come inside. But once the hormone is uh, uh, given to the cell, it comes inside, it can bind to this domain, this interaction is disrupted, so your molecules, uh, molecule of interest can come inside the nucleus. So again, here, either because it comes for passive diffusion or because it has an NLS, so otherwise it just wouldn't work. The other way is you use these uh, uh, two domains that interact via the small molecules, so rapamycin, so in this case, the design, again, uh, needs to rely on, on some shuttling of the protein of interest that is fused to one domain. Um, so this is happening all the time. And then you have here the partner of this domain, which has an NLS. So this is actually accumulated inside the nucleus at any time point. Uh, then when this small molecule, rapamycin, is coming, the two will bind. And in this case, then you are simply accumulated. So you retain the protein of interest inside the nucleus via this interaction. So this is all possible and all good. Um, the, the drawback, if you want, is that you have to give either the small molecule or the hormone. So um, your trigger will be this, uh, this uh, uh, something that you give inside the medium and will diffuse everywhere. So you don't have 
very high spatial uh, uh, resolution and maybe also in terms of temporal resolution is not the very best. It takes some time for this molecule to diffuse inside. So we actually think that there is another trigger that is way better than any of that, and this is light. So actually light is, of course, as we all know, uh, critical to, to the life on, on our planet. Uh, so plants use it uh, all the time uh, to grow, to grow towards it, so they, they move really towards the, the direction of light. So they are, uh, um, so they are sensitive to this. We uh, also, of course, as human uh, beings, we, we, are, we have the circadian clock, so which means that we are active during the day, we sleep at night, if the talk is particularly boring, you might be doing this aberrant thing of sleeping during the talk, but hopefully that's not the case, even if you had a good lunch, so you shouldn't sleep. Um, so this is actually done with photoreceptors. So these are beautiful molecules that naturally sense and respond to light. And the uh, way, the most commonly they do so, is by changing their conformation via different uh, mechanisms, but eventually what happens is that the molecule in one conformation does not have the biological function and in the other conformation it has the biological function. So light changes the conformation and therefore leads to the biological function. So the photoreceptor that we use in our lab is called LOV, uh, um, is, a, is a small domain, is a light oxygen voltage domain um, and specifically is the one that comes from the oat, uh, so avena sativa, and this is has a very dramatic, undergoes a very dramatic conformational change upon blue light exposure. So in the dark state, uh, the protein has two alpha helices, uh, one at the end terminus, which is very short, and a, very lo a much longer one, which is called J-alpha helix, at the C terminus. And this is the one uh, that we exploit, we and others, of course. Um, so this, uh, actually, both helices unfold and will actually um, get farther away from the rest of the protein, the, the so-called love core domain, after, blue light, uh, uh, after the arrival of the blue light. And, uh, um, and this is quite interesting because you can use that in, in, uh, if you do the engineering of the protein in the right way to um, release either a function or a peptide, as we will see in a moment, with, the, with light. So this is the uh, paper that inspired our work, which was published in 2012 in Nature Methods. So this is uh, um, so-called, so the, the, the name that they gave to the tool is tulips. Um, and in this case, so they were the first people to show this concept. That is, if we take the J-alpha helix and now we truncate it in a way that still you have the helix so it's still there, so you're not disrupting everything and you're not, of course, completely making the protein unfold or stuff like this. Um, and we append now a short peptide at the end of this helix. The assumption would be that in the dark state, this peptide is not able to bind to a cognate domain, something this peptide binds to. And when you shine the light, due to this unfolding and, and, and uh, getting farther away of the helix from the core domain, you allow, you release the photocaging of the peptide as depicted here in this schematic. So you have the peptide and the peptide here in this conformation can't bind to some other domain that binds to this peptide and in this conformation it does. So the advantage of such a method uh, uh, are that the log domain is small, is more or less the size of a GFP, about 20 kilodalton. It is all entirely genetically encoded. So of course there are also groups that do uh, uh, optogenetics, it's not called optogenetics anymore because it's not genetic, so there is not the genetical component, but it's uh, more with done with chemistry, so they produce molecules that are photocaged and then when they shine, most of the time UV light, they release the caging and so on. But uh, of course, in, in, in general, it's better to work with uh, optogenetics because you just give, say, the plasmid to the cells and th with the DNA information and the cells will produce for you the molecule, so it's, uh, it's much easier. Another advantage of this system is that um, it is actually switching very fast. Uh, so in within uh, 30 seconds or so, the action has occurred, actually probably at a, even a shorter time scale, this opening of the helix is occurring. Um, and in the case of the love domain, is um, the reversion back to the dark state occurs. So this is entirely reversible system. 
but it is a, sp a spontaneous reversion. So it's not uh, triggered by a second um, wavelength. So there are other systems like a, a red, um, on the more shifted to the red, that has the advantage, if you want, that you can trigger the conformational change with one wavelength and trigger it back, going back with another wavelength. So this has very many advantages. And in this case, instead, you just have to wait. So it's just like waiting some time. And this time, in the case of the wild type AS love domain, is about a minute. So in about a minute, it will go back to the dark state. So this still is quite fast for cell biology purposes. For mm -hmm. neurobiology, this is unbelievably crap, right? Because there things happen super, super quickly. Mm -hmm. So you cannot think of something that takes a minute to come back. So it would have to be much faster. But for cell biology purposes, that's OK. Um, and it's all tunable, meaning that you can add mutations on the protein around the chromophore. So I, I didn't tell you. So all of this, so the, the, sensitive, the light sensitive part is a chromophore. In the case of the as love 2 is a, a flavin mononucleotide, so this is bound to the, to the uh, protein, and then that's where the light reaction occurs via va various changes that, that, that once the light is coming once the, uh, on, on this uh, chromophore. And this is actually produced by any cell type. And this is, again, an advantage depending on the application that you, that you have in mind, um, because if you do cell culture, very likely, it's absolutely OK for you to uh, um, introduce the chromophore just to the medium, and the cells will take it up. And, and so you can also go with uh, non-endogenous chromophores. But uh, when you already start going uh, to animals like uh, zebrafish or mice, and then it's not good anymore. It's not easy for you to give the externally, uh, the externally the chromophore. So that's, again, another ad advantage. Um, OK, so this is very nice. And uh, just for you to know, indeed, there were two groups that in parallel showed the same concept. And this is uh, a very reoccurring theme in, uh, in optogenetics, where two or more groups uh, come up with the very same idea, and they publish the paper separately. So this is uh, the case also here. OK, so uh, back then in my lab, uh, Dirk Benziger, who is now actually a PhD student in Mustafa Kamash uh, lab in, in the ETH, he came up with the idea of using this tulips concept to do to control nuclear import. And the idea was to simply specialize the design by introducing an NLS, so a nuclear localization sequence, as I told you a few minutes ago, is the, is the sequence that tell, tells uh, that the protein wants to go inside the nucleus. So the idea would be that in the dark state, this NLS is caged, photocaged by the love domain. So there is no binding to the endogenous import machinery. And once we give the blue light, there is this unfolding. This NLS can uh, be sensed and, and bound to by the endogenous <coughs> import machinery. And, and, and all of this, of course, can be uh, uh, reversed, because if we keep the cells in the dark, the love domain will close itself again. So if we have then now a protein that we can visualize, that, for instance, has a fluorescent uh, protein attached to it, then we would have a situation where in the dark state, the protein is ideally entirely cytoplasm, plus cytoplasmic, and in the lit state, is entirely nuclear. As you will see, this is not achievable in the cell, not this black and white uh, schematics. is not entirely outside, entirely inside. It's more something in between. But it works. OK, so how did we start? Uh, I will bring you a little bit through the design, how we did the design, so that you, you get an idea of how you, you can uh, work in, in this field. So the, the idea was to, we had to truncate the J-alpha helix and append an NLS. So what did we have to find? We had to find a suitable truncation and a suitable NLS. The good thing is that NLSs are, of course, have been studied. Uh, out of their normal context. So what do you do normally? If you want to say this works, is that you take it out of the protein, you attach it, say, to a GFP, and you show the GFP is nuclear. So that's how you can really prove that this is a, a transplantable sequence or motif that works also in other contexts. So the where, of course, uh, uh, like there is one, which is the SV40 NLS. Maybe you have heard about it before. So that's the one we uh, used, but we uh, we decided, nonetheless, to maybe change uh, one residue here and there. Um, also, for instance, the, 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 the sequence, for instance, would, uh, would have an R here. And we thought, OK, we keep the lysine, so that is the same as we found in the love domain, and so on. 
And this was a very, very small library, very few constructs, which we tested in yeast, uh, because yeast is a eukaryote, has a, the nucleus, but is also much faster to grow and easier to work with. Um, so now, in order for you to understand how we could uh, um, study it, we needed to take a fluorophore or a, a, a fluorescent protein that is compatible with the love domain. And when I say, when I say this, it means that we need to have a, a fluorescent protein that we can image without activating the love domain. And of course, this doesn't leave too many opportunities, so the red fluorescent proteins, or in our case M cherry, was the one we selected. And so here you see the results, so in, inside the cells, and uh, uh, so this is the control with, uh, without any NLS. In principle, it should be uh, equally distributed between the two compartments, and we never really quite figured out why in some cells it seems to be slightly more <laughs> nuclear, it shouldn't be. Um, but it doesn't matter because what uh, in the important thing is that there is no change in the localization between light and dark. While for all these other variants, uh, I hope you can see, uh, even just by eye, that in all the cases, after we shine blue light, we get a stronger accumulation of the signal inside the nucleus. And if we uh, do a quantification of this, we really see uh, that the various variants have an increase in uh, uh, nuclear localization after blue light. But of course, I mean, this is not amazing. So we're not talking about several fold uh, differences. It's mild, but it's there. So that was good enough for us to think we can go on. Our target was mammalian cells. So we didn't want to do it in yeast. We wanted to do it for mammalian cells. So we took the construct as it was, and we went to mammalian cells. And actually, we had a bad surprise, if you want, that it didn't work at all. And when I say it didn't work, it's actually that it was nuclear all the time. So it was nuclear also in the dark, which we didn't see for the yeast, in case of the yeast. And so we came to the conclusion that this SV4 TNLS is just too strong in mammalian cells. And uh, here comes the little parenthesis, because I really need to explain you this, otherwise you don't follow. Um, so this love domain exists in an equilibrium, these two equilibria, right? So this one with the uh, helix that is uh, there and is uh, um, bound to the love uh, domain uh, core, and this other state where the helix is unfolded and is farther away. And what the, lies, the light does, it just shifts this equilibrium a lot towards the state with the unfolded helix. But it's not that the uh, state of the closed helix does not exist at all in the light, as much as in the dark, called a fraction of the molecules will be spontaneously in the open state. So when you then have a, a transient transfection like this experiment, right? we give it to the cells, and we wait several hours. We're talking about more than 12 hours afterwards because we need to, uh, to give time to the uh, plasmid to, to, to start making, so to the machinery to start making our protein. But this means that if this even just spontaneously opening up of this helix uh, happens, and this NLS is very strong and will bind very tightly to the import machinery, it will come inside. And if you don't have anything else to counterbalance this, you end up with a situation like this. It's all inside. So what did we do? Uh, so first of all, we said, okay, let's take another NLS. So we went into the literature and we found several others and we created yet again another small library uh, with different NLSs and maybe in some cases even the same with a small mutation. Uh, and again, we use the same trick with them cherry and we look at it inside the cells and we were already very happy to see that there was one variant in this little library that was indeed responsive. Uh, where the accumulation was there. It was not amazing, but it was there. So it was a beginning, so that was good. So now that's the biggest change that we made in our design. We thought of introducing the opposite of the NLS, which is the NES. Okay? So in this case, the protein, all the time that it happens to go spontaneously into the nucleus, very briefly because this helix is opening or because this uh, NLS is very strong or, or strong enough, will be also always exposing the contradicting sequence, if you want, so the NES. They will tell you have to go out. So the machinery will work for us to keep on exporting the protein out of the nucleus. And um, of course, now it's a matter of setting the balance right, because we have the NES that binds to the exporting and an NLS that binds to the importing alpha and beta. So if we uh, design the construct in a way that this NES is super strong, we will end up with a very heavily cytoplasmic, um, cytoplasmically localized protein, 
which we might not be able to bring into the nucleus if and the NES is too strong. On the opposite, if we have now a very strong NLS, having added this NES doesn't do anything because the NLS is winning all the time. So practically, it's a matter of finding uh, the good balance between these two uh, sequences. And now, if we take the construct I showed you before, that was a little bit responsive, and we add an NES, so we don't change the design on the NLS part, we just add an NES. Now we really see um, that we get a protein that is really cytoplasmic in the dark state and can get inside the nucleus uh, with the light. Um, and just to tell you, the position of the NES or the type of NES matters, so it's not that if you, you just place it anywhere and it will work all the time. So you have to care a little bit about where you place it because in some cases maybe there is really s just some steric hindrance and this NES is not working, so you have it but it's not doing its function. So then we had to find a name, uh, at least I mean at the stage in which we wanted to publish, not before. Um, so we had to find a name for our, for our tool and in the optogenetics field uh, actually it's very common that you have to find it, uh, actually probably not only in optogenetics, in every field you need to find a cool name otherwise people will not notice. So uh, we really took a lot of time <laughs> to think about what, how can we call it and I, come up, uh, I came up with this idea of calling it Linus for light inducible nuclear localization sequence or signal which allows me to use this nice cartoon uh, to show you that is something that uh, runs into the nucleus. Uh, and then we ask ourselves several questions. Um, because when you make a tool, you have to convince the people that is useful. So what do you have to show that is reversible, that is tunable, that it works in different cell types, and that is uh, uh, functional somehow. Because when you do this, the design, you do it on an M cherry, but M cherry is completely insignificant because who cares about it? So you need to use it on top of a protein that has a function. Yeah, is it useful? So then, uh, that's when actually my student, Dominic, or back then it was my student, now he's a group leader, so uh, um, he was working on it, he picked up the project, and he could really show that indeed the tool is working in different cell lines. Um, it works um, not identically in the different cell lines, which already tells a lot about the fact that the cell, the different cells are in a different status, so they have different maybe amounts of importing alpha, beta, different amount of export uh, receptors and so on. So they will not really react all the time identically, but, they, but qualitatively they do always do, this, do the same. And importantly, we, we can tune the system with light intensity. So depending on the light that we are, the intensity of the light, we can have a steady state, more or less uh, accumulation inside the nucleus. So that's, of course, very important because in some cases, as you will see later on, uh, when we apply this tool uh, for the biological question, then you want to be able to achieve different accumulations inside the nucleus. So that's good that, you can that we can show that it is responsive to light intensity. So now, finally, uh, this point about the bipartite NLS. As you could see in the images, um, the import works, but it maximum that we could get was this equilibrium between the cytoplasm and the nucleus. And um, somehow we were also mostly uh, uh, pushed by the reviewers to obtain a better dynamic range, so where we have more stronger accumulation inside the nucleus. So what we thought of doing is, was to go back to this idea of the bipartite analysis, because we thought uh, in this case the spacer sequence is not very important not the sequence of it, so what is important is the length of it, but it can be anything. So um, we thought, okay, now we can go back and, and build a much bigger library where we cage this uh, uh, first basic stretch in different position, and then we leave the same sequence of the love domain, uh, J-alpha helix, untouched, and this will be the spacer, and then we append the second basic stretch, sometimes even outside, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be necessarily in, in within the helix, can be outside, because only when the two of them are both re, uh, there and they can be bound by the importing, that's when they work. Uh, and indeed, by doing so, so I don't show you really everything, the entire library, but just the two of the very good working constructs, uh, we can now get uh, um, a much stronger accumulation. So again, you have to have this, this first state, so the dark state heavily depends on which NES you are selecting. Um, so we can, we can sh I can show one, for instance, one construct where it's, it's very nuclear to begin with and becomes only nuclear after. And if you change the NES, then you get something more like this. So it's really, really dependent on the type of NLS and NES uh, that you get. So this is uh, um, quite nice. And um, 
this is the end of this part um, where practically the take home message is that this tool is there, is available for anybody that wants to use it. So plasmids are on Adgene and uh, you are more than welcome to try it uh, in case you have a protein of interest that would profit from, from uh, fusing it and, and being able to control it, uh, uh, control your localization.